Shelby here. The team and I are busy dreaming up the rest of the year, and we want to hear from you, Wild Ideas listeners. We've created a short five-minute survey that asks a range of questions to get to know you, your adventure style, and the topics you're most interested in. To participate, head to bit.ly slash wild underscore ideas. Again, it'll only take five minutes to complete, and we would love to hear from you. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash wild underscore ideas, or just head to the link in our show notes. That's for me why I started loving cycling is is because of bikepacking. So you carry what you need, go long distances, and then it's like so unpredictable. And the bike's basically the tool to do this. And I think it grabs people from different sports or different ways of life because of the adventure of it. You get to kind of cater it to, to your preferences. How far do you want to go? What, what kind of riding do you want to do? You start looking at maps and seeing how you can connect places. And it's there are a lot of skills involved, but it's also really dreamy. Leo Wilcox is known as one of the world's best ultra-endurance cyclists. She's ridden over 150,000 miles in more than 50 countries. Leo doesn't just go the distance. She also competes in bikepacking races. She's broken records crossing the U.S. from north to south and from west to east. On these rides, Leo carries all her own gear. She spends weeks at a time crossing plains and mountains, riding through intense heat and storms, and even encountering some impressive wildlife. Now, Lael is going after her wildest idea yet, to break the record for cycling around the world. Her goal is to ride more than 18,000 miles in 110 days. I'm Shelby Stanger, and this is Wild Ideas Worth Living, an REI Co-op Studios production brought to you by Capital One. When Lael Wilcox was 28 years old, she borrowed her mom's bike and entered her first race. It was 400 miles long and she finished second overall. She had never biked that far before race day. Now, just nine years later, Lael has made a career out of racing and bikepacking. She normally lives in Tucson, Arizona, but at the time of this interview, Lael was back where she grew up in Alaska, preparing for another long distance cycling event. Lael, I just want to start. Thank you for coming to a studio in Anchorage, Alaska to do this interview. It's nine o'clock in California and sunny, and it's still pitch black dark where you are. Yeah. What is that like? I mean, Alaska, it's got its own time zone. It's eight o'clock here and it won't, the sun won't come up until 945 and we're gaining daylight. I mean, I grew up here, but I just got up here uh, three days ago, and it's such a shock, and it's so cool. It's so snowy and beautiful and so cold. It's like negative 12. Whew. Oh, man, and I'm complaining about 59. That's amazing. What was it like to grow up in Alaska? Where do you live now? Yeah, so now I live in Tucson, Arizona, which is a super common That is like place. the most extreme opposite. I know, but Alaskans are such snowbirds. They're like, I want to go to the desert. I want to go to the sun. I think for me, it's because I grew up with the darkness and I like winter, but the darkness is tough. But, you know, I'm up here for about five weeks and it's refreshing. It's different. I, I've seen like six moose biking since I've been home. It's so much fun. Oh, it was fun so to grow cool. up here. You know, in the summer, it's endless daylight, and it's so wild, even even in the biggest city in the state. I think I need to go to Alaska this year. You're selling me on it. What other sports did you play as a kid, or did you just gravitate towards biking? No, not a bit. I uh, I loved sports as a kid. I started, like, running when I was six, you know, and I always wanted to go farther. I ran like a 10K and I was like, yeah, I lost feeling in my legs and I was like, this is so cool. And then I played basketball and I played soccer and I skied. I mean, like I did everything I could just because I liked it, but I, I wasn't very good at them. I mean, I was fine. But you know, if I had been better, I probably never would have biked. It's funny how the world takes you on this path that leads you exactly where you're meant to be. How did you get into cycling? Was it like by necessity? I mean, I don't think of Alaska. I mean, I guess I do think of it as a big place that people do these grand bike rides. But I'm curious, like, 
Why'd you pick that sport? I mean, you know, it wasn't when I was growing up. We learned how to ride bikes as kids, but I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't really know it was a sport. You know, it was like kind of you ride to see your friend or to the store or whatever. But I didn't really start riding until I was 20. Uh, and then that was I was going to college in Tacoma, Washington. And I I was working at a brewery. It was like downtown Tacoma, I think like four miles away, down a huge hill and then back up the hill at the end of the shift. I borrowed a bike to ride to work. I've never owned a car. I've never really driven So then the bike was like my first vehicle, and it was like, it's such a wild change. I was like, wow, this is so much faster than walking. I was riding to work and then all over town, and then my first big ride was riding to my sister's house in Seattle, Uh, and it was like 45, 50 miles. I I was like, I don't know if I can get there. You know, I mean, I, I didn't even know people rode that far, and it was just the biggest deal to make it. You know, and then immediately during that ride, it clicked. I was like, if I could ride to Seattle, I could ride across the country. Uh, And this was like, yeah, probably like 2008. And then like a few months later, that's what I was doing. I was like, I think I'm just, I'm so impulsive. I'm so kind of bitten by these ideas that I just have to do them. Um, And that totally changed my life. So you rode to your sister's house, you made it. And then what happened? Yeah. And then I was like, I want to do a ride across the country And I was like, okay, I just, this is so cool. I won't know where I'm going to sleep, but I'll just carry a tent and try to ride like 50 miles a day and figure it out. Um, But I didn't have any money, so I think I worked for a few months and then did my first trip down the East Coast from Montreal to Key West, Florida. (laughs) This is so cool. I'd never been to any of those states. You know, I was always in the West, and uh, I learned a lot I was like, where where can you camp for free? Because I didn't want to spend any money. You know, I didn't have any. And then I'm like, what do you eat along the way? What do you actually need? And um, so it was kind of scary, but then it's a pretty fast learning curve. I ended up in Florida in like November and I was out of money and I was as far south as I could go. So I got a job as a pedicab driver, you know, like the bicycle taxi. And that's actually when I got my license because you have to have a driver's license to be a bike taxi driver. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but I, I practiced for like one hour and then took the test. And then when I passed, I was like, I'm never driving again. So you don't drive? No. It's terrifying. You know, it's like I'm behind like the steering wheel and I immediately break out in a sweat. So you don't drive, but you'll ride your bike in Alaska past bears and moose and in the middle of nowhere and camp like where there is no one. Yeah, but isn't isn't there something alluring to that? You're like, I want to see those animals. I can't believe they still exist. That first cross-country bike trip was in 2008. And after that, Lael did everything she could to continue bikepacking. She worked half the year in restaurants and bike shops, and the other half she spent riding around North America, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. For Lael, bikepacking was the top priority in her life, and after seven years of ultracycling for fun, she started racing. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, bikepacking. And what hooked you in? I think that's like for me why I I started loving cycling is is because of bikepacking. So you carry what you need, uh, you go long distances, and then it's like so unpredictable. And there are a lot of skills involved, but it's also really dreamy, you know. And then to like experience nature like that, to spend that time outside, and then also feel like you're going somewhere. And the bike's an easy way to carry stuff. Versus like putting it in a pack on your back and you can make better distance in the days and kind of mix it up between trails and roads and all of that. Any stories about bikepacking those early days that really stand out that you could tell us about? I I remember like one ride, I started with like pants and a t-shirt and I get cold. So then I go to the gas station, buy a sweatshirt. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to go like with nothing and just see what happens. And then that kind of sank its teeth into me. And I later that summer did my first race on my mom's bike. It was like a 400 mile race. And there was a cutoff time of 32 hours. And I was like, I don't even know if I can finish. And then just that was enough to like 
excite me to try because I was like the going into something where you really don't know if you can possibly do it. I was like, that's so cool. And then if I don't, who cares? And then I, I finished in like 27 hours and I was like, I'm not even that tired. I feel fine. And I think that's when I really realized like, oh yeah, I could just go forever. So then as it progressed, I started like finding bike packing races, these ultra endurance races from point A to point B. And I had zero interest in racing, but I thought, you know, if somebody put this route together, it's probably pretty special. So I started following those routes as like travel, ways to travel like treasure maps. And then I was doing that for several years, you know, working jobs and restaurants and bike shops to save money to travel. And then in the seventh year of that, I realized I'd still be in Israel when this race was happening and I was following the route. And I was like, well, maybe I'll try the race and see how it goes. And then that was really when it clicked that I loved racing. I loved the competition. I loved like chasing these guys and trying to beat them and, you know, trying to strategize minimizing sleep. And it's just like this wild game where you're like, can I cross the country faster than everybody else? You know, and and how is that possible? This is like, yeah, you have to ride, you have to ride fast, but you also have to, in this style of racing, take care of all your own needs. You have to find food and places to sleep and fix your bike and you know, kind of deal with all the elements. And something about that, I just thought, oh, this is the best. And you were really good. Like, you won. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, what a surprise (laughs) to me and everybody else. You know, it's like, you never know what you can do until you try. And you're like, that looks impossible, you know, to ride like 850 miles. But it looks impossible for everyone. You know, it's like, who, who knows that they're good at that? Because it's like, how are you going to do like day five? You know, when you're out there, how's your body going to respond? How are you mentally going to feel? Can you keep going? You know, and then uh, the, for me, it was just such a huge deal to realize like I could I could do this and I could do it well and I liked it. And yeah, it hurt. And there's like a lot of sacrifice involved. But uh, overall, I, I really enjoy being out there. After that first bikepacking race, Lael took the world of ultra cycling by storm. She flew home to Alaska, bought a new bike, and within a couple of weeks, she competed in the Tour Divide bike race. The route starts in Canada, passes south through the Rocky Mountains, and ends at the Mexican border. To her surprise, Lael ended up breaking the woman's record by two days. Shortly after, she did another solo time trial of that same route, and she ended up breaking her own record by another day and a half. The next year, Leo won another race crossing the U.S. from west to east, beating all the other competitors, including the men. Even though she was making her mark on the professional cycling scene, Leo wasn't making much money. She and her wife, Rue, were waiting tables at a pizza restaurant when she eventually landed her first contract as a sponsored athlete. Once she got that gig, things started to shift. Rue is a photojournalist, and together, the two started making content for cycling brands. When we come back, Lael tells us about some of the craziest experiences she's had on the bike and her plan to break another outrageous record this year. Here's a cool wild idea. REI and Capital One have partnered to support the mission of creating a more equitable outdoors, something that's important to us at Wild Ideas and to you, our listeners. Through the REI Co-op MasterCard program, Capital One and REI donate $2 million every year to the REI Cooperative Action Fund. That donation supports more than 200 nonprofit organizations across the country working to create a more equitable outdoors for everyone. If you want to find local REI fund grantees in your community and learn more about the amazing work they're doing, check out the link in our show notes. And to learn more about the REI Co-op MasterCard program, go to rei.com slash MasterCard dash podcast. That's rei.com slash MasterCard dash podcast. In the same pioneering spirit of our podcast, Teva is all about bringing wild ideas to life. 
Tevo was born in 1984 when a resourceful river guide strapped two Velcro watch bands to a pair of old flip-flops while adventuring across the Grand Canyon. The company has retained the same pioneering spirit ever since. Their brand mission is simple, to be your guide for adventure in the modern outdoors. This spring, they're introducing a fresh batch of earth-conscious materials that are sustainably minded and help reduce our impact. The Hurricane XL T2 Sport Sandal is made to go just about anywhere, delivering all-day comfort with a cushy EVA footbed, padded heel strap, and Rapids Ready rubber sole. If boots are more your vibe, the Grandview GTX is Teva's most technical hiker yet, engineered with a breathable Gore-Tex upper that seals out the elements. The patented universal heel lock system reduces toe pressure while trekking downhill, keeping you secure and comfortable. So whether you're seeking a do-it-all sports sandal or a style to take on the trail, Teva has a pair for you. Check out the consciously crafted Teva footwear this spring with select colors available at your local REI and at REI.com. Last year, I had the honor of interviewing Evelyn Escobar, who is the founder of Hike Club, a decolonial women's outdoor collective. I love that Hike Club is creating ways for women to connect outside, which is why I'm excited to share that the North Face and Hike Club have teamed up to make a fun and functional women's hike collection. The pieces are amazing. Together, the North Face and Hike Club are working to celebrate inclusive exploration and expand the narrative around the outdoors something I know Wild Ideas listeners can get behind. This collab is for REI co-op members and is officially available now through May 31st, while supplies last. Grab this limited edition collab before it's gone. You can find the collection at REI.com and in select stores. Again, that's REI.com and in select stores across the U.S. When professional endurance cyclist Leo Wilcox was in her 20s, she discovered a talent and passion for long-distance bike racing. The type of cycling that Leo does often requires that she spends weeks or months in the saddle. In fact, last year Leo spent 330 days on her bike and she competed in several multi-week races in Europe and North America. With all the time she's spent riding, Leo has had some amazing adventures including plenty of funny moments and close calls. So on most adventures, any good adventure, something doesn't go as planned. And when you're self-supported, that means you're carrying all your own gear. You've got to take care of your own food, where to stay, your bike, if it breaks, etc. Any stories of like when it didn't really go that well, but you got yeah, out of the jail? every time. There's <laughs> something crazy that happens and when I think about it I'm like well the worst part is being at home before the ride and like waking up in the night imagining everything that could go wrong but usually when you're out there something goes wrong but you don't know what it's going to be so you can't prepare for it so um gosh I I've done this race from Canada to Mexico five times and the stuff that happens out there, some is like scary and some is hilarious. One one night I was sleeping by a bridge and I wake up in the night and there's like a white fox right next to me. And I'm like, whoa. And then I was like kind of yelled at the fox. I'm really tired. I just want to sleep. And, and I fall asleep again. And then I wake up in the morning and the fox had stolen all of my food. <laughs> And you're like, and then you're like, is this real right now? Like, uh, I, uh, and then what do I do? You know, I'd stolen like, like three quarters of a pound of salami, cookies, chips, all kinds of stuff. I had like a few like pieces of bread. And I was like, I've got to ride like 130 miles to get food. But I knew like down the road, there was kind of a bed and breakfast. But I'm such a nut. I don't want to like take the time to sit and eat breakfast. So then I get there and I ask them if they'd put it all in little Ziploc bags so I could carry it with me and eat it on my bike. You know, I did like that same route. Years later, I ran into a mountain lion at like midnight. 
you know, I don't know what to do. I'm by myself. It's dark. I like my lights had shined on some eyes. And I was like, oh, no, uh, what is that? And then I kind of like stop and it like lights up and I see the shape. And I was like, oh, my God, like a mountain lion. I've never seen a mountain lion before. And then it's like, what would you do? You know, I just stopped and I stood there talking to it. <laughs> what did you say to it? <laughs> it's like, hey, I'm just here. I just want to get by. And then I hear this kind of chirping. And uh, that's like the sound the cubs make. So then I'm like, okay, this is probably really bad because it's like a mama mountain lion and cubs. And then, you know, you don't want her to feel protective of the cubs and go after me. Um, and so I just stood there for like 10 minutes talking and I'm kind of close to the top of a pass. So I was like, okay, if she starts coming at me, then I'll turn around and try to sprint down. Downhill will be like my safety, but I'm also like trying to break a record. So I'm like, well, I really do want to get by. So like eventually I'm just like, I've been here for like 10 minutes and I start just like rolling my bike slowly forward, still talking to her. And then she goes ahead of me and like walks me down the road for like, I don't know how long it felt like 15 minutes just walking and I'm behind walking slowly. And then eventually she like ran down the side of the road. And then I was like, ah, I'm out of here. And then immediately my light lights up like a white and black tail. And it was a skunk. (laughs) And I was like, this night will never end. (laughs) What about bears? Bears I see a lot. Um, because I'm from Alaska. So then, like, riding down through Canada the first time, I saw, like, 100 bears. But the bears, like, generally don't want to, like, attack you. So I would just, like, yell, like, hey, hey, you know, and then change the pitch of my voice if it didn't move. And usually, <laughs> usually eventually the bear would run away. I've only had, like, one bear kind of come at me where I was like, uh-oh. Uh Tell that story. Okay, so I had done this project to ride all the roads in Alaska. And then the next summer, I went back there with with Rue on my birthday. I'm like, cool, I'm going to ride these roads again because they were some of my favorites. So beautiful. No trees, wide open land. We're riding together. And then kind of like a few hours in, she's like, I've had enough. She goes back with the bear spray. And then I'm like, well, I'm going to keep going. And then I see like a short road out to the coast. So I start riding that. And then I see like this blonde grizzly. Um, And usually I just yell like, hey, hey. And then the bear like reared up and starts like coming towards me. And I was like, oh, my God, this is real. And then I, I just turned around and started sprinting away. And the bear lost interest. So you couldn't have out biked a bear no could you have? no if the bear wanted to get me that would have been it because i mean these animals are so are you not bad. supposed to run away i mean what are you supposed well, to I do i don't know yeah there is no rules really huh i'm not gonna i'm not gonna stand there and wait <laughs> <laughs> good for you i mean obviously you're here today how was that conversation with rue when you got home oh man i mean i wonder when i even told her because sometimes i just get back and i'm so shelled i like forgot And then a day later, I'm like, oh, yeah, this happened. (laughs) This time, actually, we had a flight out the next day, and I was like, oh, I'm still going to ride all the way to this village. But then it's like, you know, 75 miles back. And I get there in the evening, and then I'm like, I really hope I can find somebody to hitch a ride with back. And there was some guy that was there, like, fixing the telephone lines, and so he gave me a lift. And I was like, oh, thank God. Because otherwise I'd have to like ride all night to get back. Uh, I love that you're comfortable hitchhiking. Yeah. And the thing in Alaska, it's like the easiest place to hitch because there's like one road. And I don't know. I think I think people are good. And, and you know, it's nice of them to get. If, if I got like a weird vibe from somebody, I'd just be like, I don't think so. You know, but I've gotten some, I mean, so funny. I got a ride with a guy once and he was like actively hunting. He's like, I saw something. I saw something. And then he like shot a coyote and he's like, this will only take like 40 minutes. And he like skinned it and put it on the roof. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) wow. That's amazing. Yeah. You have some stories, Lyle. So the hitching is almost even more fun, but I'm like, I actually like riding my bike, but you know, I want to get back.
I'm in awe of Lael's positivity, even when she's in the most extreme situations. Actually, as we were producing this episode, Lael was biking the Iditarod Trail Invitational in Alaska. The route crosses over frozen rivers and lakes in the far reaches of Alaska's wilderness. It was cold, like negative 40 degrees, but even so, Lael came in first in the women's division. Lael's next project is a little bit bigger. This summer, she's going after the around the world record. Her goal is to bike 18,000 miles in 110 days. Starting May 26th, Leo will ride from Chicago to New York City. Then she'll fly across the Atlantic for the European leg of the journey, riding from Portugal to Georgia, the country. From there, she'll fly to Thailand and bike to Singapore before crossing Australia and New Zealand. Finally, she'll finish up her trip by cycling from Alaska back to Chicago. You have this really wild idea. Like, you have wild ideas, tons of wild ideas. And now you're attempting to break the around the world record on a bike. How did this idea come to be? What's your why? Yeah, this is, uh, it's something I've wanted to do since I raced across the U.S. Um, Because, you know, it's cool these records exist. But then you're like, what does that even mean to race around the world? Because you have to like connect continents with flights and that kind of stuff. And um, so I like started, uh, I've been kind of thinking about it and then looking into what are the actual rules and, you know, is this something I'd like to do? I started thinking about it in 2016. And then last summer I was riding to the start of the Tour Divide, which starts in Banff, Canada. And while I was riding up there, I was like, this is so much fun. Just I was riding through the mountains in California and it was so super beautiful. And I'm like, this is what I want to do. I just want to ride every day and then just cover this distance and see if I can have fun along the way and kind of just be doing my own thing. So it's outside of a race. So I I decided, yeah, last year I'm going to go after the around the world record, which means I have to ride at least 18,000 miles, either east or west. I make my own route and I get to ride in a lot of new places. So like across Australia, across New Zealand, across Turkey to Georgia, um, but then go to some familiar places like riding from Alaska to down the west coast of the U.S. and up the Route 66. And for me, it's like I've been racing and doing this stuff for maybe about eight years, nine years, and I want to go bigger. You know, I want to do something that I'm like, can I can I finish that? How long will it take? And, and then I also want to uh, invite people to come ride with me. You know, I think it'll just be fun. I mean, it'll be hard, but also a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I can't believe I get to do this. It's going to be so awesome. What's the current record? It's a, uh, The women's record is 124 days. Uh, so I'm aiming for 110. Amazing. Which means I have to average 163 miles a day, but then you like lose a few days to travel and that kind of stuff. But I think I can do it. I'm so excited for you. So you'll be supported, though. There'll be, no. you know, Rue will be there. Well, no. she'll be there to shoot. So she'll be there to, like, take photos and videos. But there's no difference in the record between supported or self-supported. There's just one record. Interesting. Um, so you can you could have, like, an RV follow you and, you know, take care of your needs. I don't think that sounds like as much fun. But I do think like there are different ideas of like what support means now. It's like if you talk to somebody, that's support. You know, and I'm like, I'm riding around the world. I wanna I wanna talk to people. I wanna see people. I <laughs> yeah. wanna be like a part of a part of what I'm passing through. So I think uh I'm gonna take care of all my own needs, but um it's like an open invite for people to join. Uh so hopefully it's like a rolling party. How does someone like, I, I get that you're not someone who needs a lot of things, but it's still expensive, like bikes and plane tickets, etc. How are you funding it? Totally. I mean, this is a huge gift. So my bike sponsor is specialized, uh, and I've been riding their bikes since 2015. And I told them this idea, and they're like, oh, we can cover your expenses to do that. For the most part, I mean, like, like basic, like travel or like regular plane tickets and some hotels and food. Uh, 
because it's expensive, you know, that's a lot. So that's huge. And then I had this idea and I wasn't going to rope Rue into doing it <laughs> because it's so long. And she, at first she's like, forget it. You you can go do that and I'll stay home. And then the more I talked about it, the more she's like, I want to be there. I want to shoot that. You know, I want to I want to document it. So then we're kind of putting together a budget with some different sponsors to cover her expenses. And then really, I mean, like if we can not spend all of our money, that'd be great. <laughs> but I probably will. Is there like one thing you're really looking forward to or one thing you're a little nervous about? Oh, man, I don't know. I'm scared. You know, I wake up like, what if my bike breaks? Or I think like the thing is I have confidence for stuff that takes like two weeks, three weeks, and then like three months, four months. So much could happen. But then when I like, you know, this is like fear in the night. And then when I'm awake in the day, I'm like, oh, it'll be fine. It's just a bike ride. And if something breaks, I've, I'll, I'll fix it or I'll deal with it. You must feel so courageous and badass and alive after doing something like that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's helped me gain confidence, you know, because like I'm not great at a lot of these things. Like I'm not a great bike mechanic. I'm terrible at navigating. But like the more you do it, the more confidence you gain that you can do it. Or even like riding in the cold. You're like, okay, I've ridden in negative 20 for a few days and I was okay. You know, my all my clothing like froze to my face, but <laughs> I survived. <laughs> so I think it's just like, you know, you take steps into like trying something like harder, scarier. And like, I, this stuff still does scare me. Like, you know, but then I'm like, I have to try to do that, you know, because I... I don't want to be stopped by fear, you know, not for this stuff. If you want to follow along with Lael and all the incredible work she's doing, check out her Instagram at Lael Wilcox. She and her wife, Rue, have made some beautiful videos and tell stories of their adventures so wonderfully. You can also learn more about Lael on her website, laelwilcox.net. That's L A E L. W I L C O X dot net. If you like this episode with Lael, then you'll also like the episode with professional ultra runner Courtney Dewalter. The two reminded me so much of each other, and we'll link that episode up in the show notes. Wild Ideas Worth Living is part of the REI Podcast Network. It's hosted by me, Shelby Stanger, produced by Annie Fassler, Sylvia Thomas, and Sam Piers Nitzberg of Puddle Creative. Our senior producers are Jenny Barber and Hannah Boyd. Our executive producers are Paolo Motola and Joe Crosby. As always, we love it when you follow the show, take time to rate it, and write a review wherever you listen. And remember, some of the best adventures happen when you follow your wildest ideas. <laughs>